glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, welcome. That We are glad you're part of Vineyard Service, Vineyard Online, wherever you're at. Well, we started a series just a few weeks ago called The Art of Being Unordinary, and we've been looking at how when we start to follow God, He starts to really change things up, and it impacts so many areas of our lives. We've looked at how He changes our life spiritually, certainly, but also physically. We've looked at vocationally. Today, we're going to talk about how God impacts us emotionally, emotionally, how to deal with how you feel. <clears throat> and Jesus, uh, we see, talks about how we are made to be passionate, emotional when it comes to our relationship with God. Look at this. He says, you are to love the Lord your God. So this is Jesus talking. He says, with a passionate heart from the depths of your soul, with every thought and with all your strength. This is the greatest and supreme commandment. And of course, that's out of the Passion Translation. Can you feel the emotion in that statement? Passionate heart, the depths of your soul. God, or we are to love him passionately with all our heart, all our soul, all of our, our, our emotional strength, not just with head knowledge. He's saying, hey, we are to have a relationship with God that's full of feelings. Now, feelings are a part of, of, uh, of being human. And so here's some facts with when it comes to our emotions. One is, is that God has emotions. Sometimes we're not, a, we're not like dialed into that. But God actually is very feeling. He's a feeling God. He feels joy. He feels grief. He feels pain. He has hatred towards sin. He gets frustrated with people. And if God wasn't uh, a, a God of love, there would be no love. That's, that's, that's a hallmark of who we are, and love is on the planet because God, it was his idea. God created romance. He's the one who created emotions and feelings. My ability to feel is a gift from God. Now, it might not always seem that way, but our feelings, it's actually a gift. Even some of the negative ones that we have, it makes us human. It's part of the way we bring healing through loss and pain is through uh, emotions and sometimes a negative emotions. So having the ability to feel is, is, is a good thing. It's part of what creates loyalty and faithfulness and, uh, and, 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 and a bond. It causes us to be generous. There's a lot of good things that come from being a person who is where we're feeling. The Bible says God made us in his image. He says, let us make human beings in our image. So that's why we have emotions. Now, we want to avoid extremes. There are extremes. One extreme would be emotionalism. That means all that matters is emotions. It doesn't matter what I think, you know, and so we start to measure right and wrong based on how I feel. Whether it doesn't matter if it's uh, what God thinks of it. You know, it's, it's influenced by, you know, whether it's socially appropriate. And, but, but we start to rationalize and those things away because, oh, no, it's, it's how I feel. And it controls and dominates and ultimately runs my life. The other opposite is stoicism. All that matters is intellect. We're kind of like, like dead to our emotions. And we just, we let uh, intelligence and volition and will that that's all that matters and we and that dictates it it's interesting it's actually kind of funny how often you know when partners come together one will be like emotional and one not emotional right one's kind of a gusher and another is a stuffer the gusher and they marry one another oftentimes and so the gusher feels like the stuffer is you know, not in touch with who they are. They're closing down, and the stuffer feels like the, you know, the gusher is, well, you know, they're gushing. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's not just with individuals, but, you know, whole churches or even denominations or even uh, parachurch movements are, can be based around these extremes. When I, early on, I had come to Christ, I was, I, maybe a year, I came to Christ at 18, so I was probably 19. And I was introduced to this model 
uh, with this parachurch organization at the University of Arizona when I was on the campus there. I was connected with them, and they sat down. And they said, now, Andy, you need to know uh, emotions are not important. Feelings are not important. They showed me this graphic. They said, facts are the engine. That's all that drives everything. And so it's God's word. You know, just memorize his word because it was a faith organization. And then they said, and faith is the coal that feeds it. These two are important, facts and faith. Feelings is the caboose, they said. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Not important. See, that was an organization that was on an extreme. Just, just, that's all that mattered was facts. But there's also denominations where it's all about emotions. And if you don't, you know, like, you know, have a, I don't know. I mean, you just got to have some kind of rapture in the service, in the worship. You know, like, say, oh, then God didn't show up. So both of those are extremes. Now, we see in the Psalms that God exposes all these emotions in the Psalms. And it really can help us to better understand our own emotions. Because in the Psalms, you have not just good emotions, but negative ones. So like, if you read it, you can actually walk, start reading it going, what in the world? Why is this even in here? Well, it's because God wants you to see that all emotions are part of who we are. And so you see David, for example, be, be getting angry and complaining or lamenting or having sorrow or arguing with God. Or, and, and they're legitimate. Because they're processing, and it's part of who we are. We are meant to be uh, not just people of intellect, but having emotions. And also being emotionally aware. That's a big part of this. Because you're going you're gonna to find peace in your life. Uh, you're going to find uh, success in your life through managing your emotions. And you can't do that if you're not aware of your emotions. So, Let's look at that. Why I must learn to manage my emotions. One is because my feelings are often unreliable. We don't want our feelings to just dictate and dominate. And because you can have a gut feeling about something and be and be dead wrong, right? Has that ever happened? You hire somebody, I'm feeling good about this. <laughs> Famous last words. And then all of a sudden they're like, what, what, what was I thinking? Well, you weren't thinking. You were feeling. And you're hiring them on that feeling. Or how about getting involved with the opposite sex, you know, like, you know, hey, baby, you know, I'm feeling good. This is, you know, you know, and, 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 and we let our feelings, like, dictate our decision to, like, to pursue something. And, and then, you, like, down the road, you're going, wow, can't believe I made that decision. Well, it's because you just can't believe everything you feel. I don't have to believe everything I think. I don't have to accept everything I feel. Because it's not necessarily true. It feels like we're, we're consumed with a feeling. It's overwhelming. But you can be wrong. Sometimes you can be wrong about yourself. You can feel bad about yourself and get involved in self-loathing and feel and just and, and negative self-talk. And it's not true about you. But you feel it's true, so you buy into it, and you, and, you, and you rehearse it over and over. You might not tell anybody else, but you, you tell yourself. <clears throat> so you can be wrong about yourself. You can be wrong about others as well. There's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. Emotions aren't infallible, and if you let emotions dominate and rule you, you don't manage them, you can end up in a pile. You can end up in... Uh, a ditch in a place where you uh, don't want to be. It can even lead to some form of relational death, spiritual death, all kinds of death if you don't, let, if you don't manage it. Because I don't want to be manipulated. You know, you can be manipulated by your emotions. If you let your emotions dominate you, people will dial in on that. And next thing you know, you get manipulated by your moods. Because you know, they, people will take advantage of that. A boyfriend could take advantage of you, you know, and, or, or a girlfriend or, or, or a parent could take advantage of your emotions if you kind of, you know, you know tapping into that guilt, tapping into, you know, the should ofs And salespeople and advertisers take advantage of people that let their feelings dominate, right? I mean, that's... 
the way they, the colors, branding, the advertisers, when they think of, you know, you walk into a mall, they've got music going into a store. I mean, they're, they're, they're all ta- trying to tap into your emotions because they want the impulse buy, right? Buy it now. What's the, what's the word that's like the ultimate impulse buy? Sale, right? You say, oh, you know, I got to get it. It's calling me. It's calling me. And you go broke saving money, right? So, like an open city with no defenses is the man with no check on his feelings. No moderator, no governor, no manager. You're a city without defenses. The passing translation, same verse, says if you live without restraint and are unable to control your temper, you're as helpless as a city. So, you're helpless. You're defenseless. It doesn't, you know who else can manipulate you? It's Satan. Satan's favorite tool to manipulate you is through negative emotions, fear, resentment, jealousy, envy, bitterness, worry, anxiety, shame, moodiness. He'll just take a whip and continue to beat you with that. And, you, and if you let your emotions lead the way, you don't manage them, you're helpless, you're defenseless against All of the havoc he wants to wreak in your life. Now, the good news is it's a learned skill. You're not not helpless. The truth is about you that you don't have to be a victim. You don't have to be helpless. You can gain control over this because it is a learned skill. Curb every passion. That's why the Bible wouldn't tell us something we couldn't do. It says curb every passion and be on the alert. Your greatest accuser is the devil. I don't know if you refer to him as that, but he... That's how the Bible talks about it. He likes to accuse you, make you feel bad, use your emotions against you. It's going about like a roaring lion whom he can devour. devour. So you curb your your passions. He's talking about having self-control over your emotions. If you don't, Satan's going to eat your lunch is what he's saying, right? So number three is because I want to be successful in life. It's one of the number one predictors. In some studies, it is the number one predictor, is being able to uh, manage your mood, deal with how you feel, control your emotions. It's well known. It's, I guess it's been around for a couple decades now, this idea called EQ, or emotional quotient. They do that on purpose because at one point, for a long time, it was like the IQ is all, all powerful. Whoever was the smartest in the room controlled the room. But they started realizing that's really not true. That the person who does the best controlling a company, controlling a boardroom, controlling uh, an environment has the best EQ, emotional awareness of not only how you are feeling, but how others in, around you are feeling. So you don't you got to be careful not to fall into thinking, oh, that's not important. I want to manage that. People who get lost and die because of their foolishness and lack of self-control. So it's easy to get lost and lost in life. You, how many people have ruined a job opportunity because of foolishness? They posted something, doing something crazy, you know. There's some great posts from the Dream Team, but I don't think you're going to lose your job from posting anything from the party we did. But there's some parties where you probably shouldn't be posting that stuff, right? It might not even be a photo you took, a, you know, you, for, you can't even remember. I, man, that was me? I don't know. That looks like a deep fake. I don't think it was me, boss. I don't think it was me. Or you end up pregnant or with an STD because of a moment of foolishness. But the truth is that God wants us to have self-control over our emotions, over our passions, over our heart. You know, When you give your heart to Jesus, have you ever heard of that? Give your heart to Jesus. It's not give your mind to Jesus. It's give your heart to Jesus. Now, the word uh, emotions actually is not used very often in the Bible. It's usually the word passion or affections. Number one use of the word emotions in the Bible is heart. And when we, that means that when we ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life, we're saying, and, the, and inviting him into our heart and Lord of our heart, we're saying, you're Lord of my emotions. You're, I'm not just careening out of control where I'm a victim in this whole thing. No, you say, God, I want you to be a Lord of my emotions. And he also wants that. 
from now on, you must live the rest of your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not by humanly desires. And so we invite him in. Hey, God, you help me to control this. You help me to grow in this area. How to manage an unwanted feeling. So we looked at why it's important. Now we're going to look at how to do it. How to manage what feels sometimes like the unmanageable, something that can be very unwieldy. Well, first of all, you've got to identify it. You name it. you got to pinpoint it exactly. Be specific. Because if you can't name it, you certainly can't manage. You can't manage a vague feeling. It's got to be something specific where you get it. Okay, I'm, I, I, this is what's going on in my life. Over the years, I've been to a fair amount of counseling, mostly marriage counseling, because uh, I have issues, uh, I've discovered. One of these, one of these counseling appointments, uh, <laughs> got to be careful how you say all that, you know. <laughs> well, one of these counseling appointments, I'm sitting there and the counselor is saying, Andy, uh, so we're talking about feelings. And he goes, are you in touch with your feelings to me? And I go, and I think, you know, I'm not overly emotional uh, as a person. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, not overly sensitive, but I feel like I'm in touch. You know, I've got control over this thing. And so I said, yeah, yeah, I think I am. He goes, okay, Andy. He goes, well, then name me two emotions you felt last week, just this past week, two emotions. So I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, and finally I said, well, I was hungry. <laughs> he goes, that's not an emotion, that's a drive. He goes, you know, you can see it in his eyes. He's thinking, this guy's broken, man. But it, on one side, but the other side, he's thinking, I can make a fortune on this guy. He's going to be in here forever. At least maybe that's what I was thinking. But, but we get confused. We're not really sure how to identify a feeling. So I have the, what he asked me to do, I'm going to ask you to do regardless of where you're at on the emotional scheme. Because you can be very emotional and still not really be in touch with your emotions. So what I want to do is I want to take a, I'm going to make this into a counseling moment right here. I'm going to ask you to just ask yourself, identify specifically two emotions you felt this last week. Okay, cue the music. This is, identify two emotions you felt this past week. You don't have to tell anybody. I'm going to just give you about 20 seconds. Two emotions or more. Be specific. All right, all right, okay. So that was your, your. I wanted you to, so maybe it was easy for some of you, maybe not so much for others of you. How in touch am I with my feelings? You know, being able to know how you feel right here, right now. Sometimes it's harder than you think. Let me explain. If you're going through a difficult time, like when I got skin cancer or with, you know, aging parents or, you know, you have different things that come into your life and if, you're, if you've been a Christian for a while and you kind of know, kind of like, hey, this is the way I'm supposed to feel, then we kind of ignore how we really feel. Oh, I'm not supposed to be worried. I'm not supposed to have fear. I shouldn't be lonely. I shouldn't have anxiety in my life. But you do. And if you can't identify it and be honest about it, then what ends up happening is your body keeps score your blood pressure goes up you have ulcers you get insomnia maybe even nightmares all kinds of things it affects your own health you start to feel like David who said my thoughts are restless and I am confused so a lot of times when it comes to our feelings we just have to ask ourselves some tough questions is this really what's going on it's part of managing our emotions that's what am I really feeling to get beneath, beneath the surface of it Sometimes maybe we've got a little depression, we're feeling the blues, and we're thinking, oh, I'm just depressed. 
Well, why are you depressed? By the way, depression is, is like anger. It's frozen anger. It's a secondary emotion. So if you're depressed, you're angry. That's never the real emotion. It's always something else. But you ask yourself, why am I depressed? Well, maybe it was you were criticized at work. Maybe you're worried you won't graduate or your kids aren't doing well or you could get laid off or one of your, you know, your parent is getting sick. Or I mean, the, you, that's part of unpacking that. Well, I'm actually have fear going on here. That's what's going on. That's the challenge of naming it. If you stay at the surface level, then it controls you. It controls you. If you can't name it, it's already controlling. And then what are my triggers? And so there's triggers that like cause us to lose control. And, not, and being aware of that is an important part of that. Saying this, when I'm around this situation, it triggers me and I lose control control. Listen, if we can't control our emotions, then we end up often, you know, when we swallow our emotions, our stomach keeps score, right? In fact, literally, sometimes we struggle with our weight and eating, not because we're hungry. You know, a lot of times we think we're hungry and we're really not. We're hungry in our soul and our emotions. That's where the hunger is. But so sometimes we just get confused about it. We think it's physical hunger and it's really not. Here's some, some emotions. Eating and emotions are inter, intertwined, interwoven. And so what happens when we're sad? Well, a lot of times, well, when I'm sad, I need some comfort food. That, I know that helps. You know, if I eat, what about when I'm glad? Well, go out and celebrate. Woo! You know, I've got that promotion. Or what about when you're depressed? Well, if I eat some chocolate or some, you know, a pint of ice cream, that makes me feel better. What about when I'm happy? Indulge yourself. Woo, baby, what about when I'm bored? Well, get something to munch on, you know? I mean, if I've worked hard, get some revenge, you know, and reward yourself after you a hard workout. Well, you have extra calories now, you know? And, uh, if you're cold, you need to warm up on the inside. You're hot, you need something to cool off, get a slurpee. I mean, it's so tied in <laughs> with, you know, our emotions are tied, and, we, and sometimes we're like self-destructive. And I don't want to pick on food only because... Sometimes it's cutting, sometimes it's medication, it's alcohol, it's sex. There's all kinds of ways that we respond in, where we're victims to our emotions because we're we're, we haven't figured out the trigger. We don't really know what's going on. Emotions weren't meant to be swallowed. They were meant to be shared. That's one of the powers of a small group. We're in a small group. It's a place, a safe place where you can share what's going on in your life. You don't have to give in to the destructive behaviors. And you can be honest about what's going on and what's triggering what's going on in your life. So you need to be able to name it. And the second thing is you challenge it. It may not be accurate. It might not be the truth. It might not be reality. It's not correct. But if you don't evaluate it, often we just assume it is. David said this, Lord, cross-examine me. Test my motives and my affections. Those are your motives, your affections. That's he's talking about your feelings. And so you, David's asking God to evaluate. But you know beyond asking God, which is good, because God knows us better than us. But it's also asking a friend. Now, they've got to be a pretty close friend, because we'll tend to get defensive, right? If we share our feelings and they go, well, that's not reality. Wait a minute, you got to validate me. Well, you do. It, it, it validating doesn't mean it's true. It, you, it's valid that, you know, you feel that way, you got that way into that spot for a reason. We're not like dissing you. But it doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean you have a correct understanding. It says The Bible says you can trust a friend who wounds you with his honesty. Do you have a friend like that? Or the minute they wound you, you say, you're not my friend anymore. You know, unfriend, delete, goodbye. Some of you consider me that friend where you give me an opportunity to wound you with honesty. Now, hopefully, I don't take advantage of that. Hopefully, nobody takes advantage of that, right? Because that's part of what it means to have a trusting friend. Job had a friend, Eliphaz. He said this. What, he's talking to Job. He goes, why has your heart carried you away? And why do your eyes flash? It's a poetic way of saying you're going off the deep end here, Job. You know, you're not doing well. It's, that's not reality. And so hopefully they share it out of love. But it can happen in a small group and does. It can happen with somebody else you let into your life. 
ask yourself three questions when you're irritated, when you're upset, when you're angry. These things, you say, what's the real reason I'm feeling this? What's, what's, you're trying to go below the, the surface, right? Why am I feeling this frustration, this anxiety, this, this hurt, this pain? You see, sometimes, you know, you lash out at somebody, and it's really because of what your coach or a parent said to you when you were a kid. And they're just saying the same phrase, and boom, it's a trigger, and you lash out. It's really not about what's going on in this, in this moment. It's because of unresolved stuff in your past. That's why one of the reasons we do our freedom uh, course in, uh, in small groups. If you haven't taken freedom, it's one of the ways we help. We want everybody to be in a healthy place emotionally. And we try to help you to get in that place. Number two is, is, is it true? Is, is this the source of why I feel this way even true? Elijah, prophet in the Old Testament, was all upset. He was depressed. He was discouraged. He's complaining to God. And he goes, God, I'm the only one who even serves you right now in the whole country. God goes, that's not true, Elijah. I got all these people. They love me. What was really going on? If you know the story, he was afraid. But he, his, he, wasn't, he, had, he didn't unravel that other feeling. until He does later on. But at, at first he's just like, he's responding. And you, until you can, ch- unless you can challenge it, and he let God challenge it, then we get stuck there. But the third question is, is, is what I'm feeling helping me or hurting me? What I'm feeling, is that helping me? Or is it hurt? Sometimes if we just let our feelings go, it feels better, but it hurts the situation. You go to a restaurant, and you're waiting for a long time to get served. You look out, there's empty tables everywhere, but they don't serve you. Finally, you get served. Nobody comes over. They don't give you any water, no menu. Then you're there like for 10, 15 minutes, and another couple comes in, and then they get served, and they're starting to eat before you. And you're by then, you're like, oh, going crazy. Why? Well, I'm angry because I'm busy and I have things to do. No, no, that's not what's going on. You're angry and it's not just because you're hungry. It's because you feel slighted and you wanted something different to happen. And so our tendency is to nag. Does nagging, in fact, if you get all upset at the server, does that make them go quicker? No, they tend to ignore you even more, right? You get the opposite of what what you want. You just want better service. So sometimes, but it feels better if we start lashing out, yelling, good luck getting your tip, and, you know, but it, it, it makes us feel better because we're so upset, but we need to really challenge it. So we name it, we challenge it. Is it true? Is it helping me? And then lastly is to tame it. Now, it would be remiss of me to just leave this in the uh, psychological domain. Because the truth is, God does want to help you. And so the Holy Spirit, there's a big part of this where when we invite God's presence, the Holy Spirit into our life, He can be a game changer. God can be a game changer in your life. So I want you to have these, we're going to close with these two suggestions. They're prayers to begin each day. Asking God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. You don't really need more willpower. You need God's God's Holy Spirit. His direction, His help. God, help me to manage my moods. Help me with my emotions. In Galatians 5, we're told when the Holy Spirit controls our life. So it's an issue of control, right? Who's in control of your life? Because on our own, when we're in control, yeah, we just, I mean, we know how to ruin things. But the Holy Spirit, when He's in control, He will produce these kinds of things in our life. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. <clears throat> when you're impatient, that's not the Holy Spirit controlling you. I don't care if you just spent three, three hours in a, in a Bible study. When you're not kind to somebody, that's not the Holy Spirit controlling you. At that, in that moment, you, you, you kind of lost control there where you, you've taken control back really. So you begin, God, I want you to be in control. You see, whenever we're under pressure, that's the time we get tested. 
Because we think we're in control. Okay, God, you've got control. Woo! I'm going to hit the day today. And then something happens where we're in pressure. Somebody cuts us off. We get yelled at at work or something. And all of a sudden, whatever, when you put something under pressure, whatever's inside comes out, right? You squeeze it, toothpaste. You squeeze it, toothpaste comes out, not something else. And so that's part of what happens is God will show us little moments. That's what is still out of control in your life, Andy. That's what's still out of control. And then every day I ask God to help me to manage my mouth. Guarding our mouth is an important part of this. Because we're thinking all these things, we're feeling all these things, <clears throat> but in the end, we decide what we allow to come out of our mouth. The Bible says, guard your words and you'll guard your life. But if you don't control your tongue, it will ruin everything. Now, a word that Sharon and I have grown into that we use, and we have immediate grace to use this word, and the word is never mind. I'll start to say something, you know, and then I think, hmm, that's not good. That will lead to bad places. And so I'll go, never mind. Now, back in the day when we were kind of new at all this, Sharon would go, no, I want to know, you know. <laughs> She's realized over the years she doesn't want to know. And she does it as well. And I'll go, and I'm thinking to myself, I'll go, okay. And then I'm thinking to myself, praise God, she stopped, you know. <laughs> Whatever it was, I don't need to hear that, I'm sure, you know. So you just, but you control it. And sometimes it's like the first word or two come out. So if you're in a relationship with somebody, we need to give each other the grace to be able to stop right then and there. And don't try to coax it out of them. Because we're all kind of growing in this, right? None of us are perfect. None of us have it all down. The Bible says that our words or like a bit in a horse's mouth, and it turns the head, and that's the direction that your life will go. Just like a rudder does on a boat, or just even a small spark can start a whole fire, the Bible says. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. The whole chapter is almost on this. I just pulled out one. Just think of how a small flame can start a huge force, and then the tongue is like a fire. In other words, your, t your heart, and your mouth are connected. They, there's, there, what's going on inside ends up coming out. You're going, Andy, are you talking about Freud's, you know, subconscious? No, I'm talking about what Jesus said. Jesus said, whatever is in the heart overflows into the speech. Our heart is revealed in our words. And so when you, whatever we say, we can use that as a, hey, that's a measurement. I'm I need, it. I need something changed in my heart. Some of you just need a heart transplant. Your heart is, you've got a bitter heart or a worried heart. I mean, it's just consumed in that. We're talking, remember, heart is a metaphor for emotions. You've got an angry heart, a lonely heart, a prideful heart, an arrogant heart, jealous heart, an envious heart, impatient heart. All of those, you need heart surgery. God, come be the Lord, not just of my life, but of my heart. Direct me and guide me. Let's bow our heads and pray. So let's just take a few moments. Give these to God in prayer. Say, God, thank you for giving me the ability to feel. So maybe you're like me and you say, I'm not really a feeler. Well, you really are. There might be reasons why you have a hard time accessing it. You say, God, give me the power to change, to channel it. I know feelings are unreliable, and I just don't want to be manipulated by them or by others. I don't want to let other people manipulate me. I don't want the devil to manipulate me. You say, God, help me to name to get beyond, just below the surface, to be more self-aware, emotionally self-aware. You say, God, help me to challenge my emotions. <clears throat> to ask, is it, is it true? Is it helpful? Where will this lead me if I let it continue? Now, the most important of all of this is letting God be the 
Lord of your heart. Inviting him into your heart. Say, God, I want a heart of love and not hate. I want a heart, I want emotions of peace and not chaos. Of joy and not sorrow. Come fill me. In fact, I want to lead you in a prayer. If you're far from God, maybe you're saying, hey, Andy, I do need that heart transplant. I need a fresh start. I don't feel close to God. Then I want to ask you to follow me in a prayer. I want to lead you right into the arms of our loving God. You can do that right where you're at. And just, just a quiet prayer just between you and God. You're going, Andy, I'm not sure what to say. Well, that's why I want to lead you in that prayer. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you're online, you're saying, I want to take a next step with God. I want to come close to God. I want to give my heart to God. Then I want you to follow me in prayer. You can let me know that you're praying with me just by putting your hand up so I can see. Would you do that? Just slip your hand up just so I can see. Okay. Yep. Bless you. Yep. I see that. Okay. Anybody else saying, I want to, I want to put Christ in my life. I want him to be the Lord of my life and my heart. All right. Bless you. Yep. Okay. Put your hands down. Pray this prayer. Say, God, I want you to help me to control these things in my life. I don't want to do it on my own. Say, God, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. To live a life that's pure and perfect. And then to die in my stead. The life I couldn't live. And took the punishment I deserved. You say, God, thank you for doing that for me. And then three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead. And the power of of the living Christ is available to you. This, say, this morning, I invite you to fill me up. Would you say that? God, fill me up with your, your presence and your power. Guide me. Help me to guard my mouth. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Would you congratulate everyone who prayed with me? I certainly am proud of you. I've been praying for you. I would like to hear from you. If you prayed to ask Christ into your life, let me know. You can do that on the Connect card that's on the seat back in front of you. If you're serving in the next service, you can go ahead and go now. Thank you for serving those who uh, don't, you, you don't even know who their name or anything about them, but you're there to just serve them and love on them, uh, this church or we couldn't do what we do without you. Well, we have our step one right after this service. We'd love to have you in there. Pastor Sharon and I will be in there. We're going to be teaching it. We'd love to get to know you a little bit, hear about your story. You can certainly learn more about our church and, and uh, find out all you need to know to say, hey, it's, it's, you know, this is the church for me. So right after the service, on the way out, you'll see it. We'll watch your kids, and we've got something for you to eat. Thank you for coming to step one. Uh, maybe you weren't even planning on it. We'd love to have you in there. Maybe you've taken it before. You can take it again. That's that, perfectly fine. We have people do it all the time. Well, if you would, uh, y there's a way for you to contribute. If you're new with us, we ask that you just, we're thankful that you're here. Don't feel pressure to give. But for those of you who this is your church home, we say thank you for giving. And here's the way that you can, you can give. You can give through um, online, texting. You can do it through a check, put it on the clear boxes on the way out. And I also want to pray for you. First Sunday, first Sunday of every month, uh, it's my honor to pray over each uh, of the homes that are supporting this church. So uh, would you do that? Let me ask you to stand right now if you would, if you can. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in this church, changing lives. Make We get to make a difference for you. And so, God, I pray over the finances of each of the homes here. Lord, you talk about the power of, of, uh, of, of giving to you, sowing into your kingdom, and how we will be blessed in return. So, Lord, I pray for that in Jesus' name.